Hello and welcome to our continuing 2017 educational webinar series. I am Dr. Jill Brooks, Senior Director of Education for First Healthcare Compliance. At First Healthcare Compliance, we help you with a comprehensive compliance management solution tailored to your business, a hospital, hospital network, healthcare practice of any size, billing company, or skilled nursing facility. As part of our complimentary educational webinar series, we bring you experts from around the country to discuss relevant topics in the healthcare industry. We are so pleased to have Stephen Bittinger of Bittinger Law discussing improper retention of overpayments, reverse false claims, and private payer policies. Stephen leads the healthcare law team that has developed a national reputation for excellence in the complex legal arena of healthcare reimbursement. The team defends all types of providers and privately held healthcare businesses with a focus on audit defense and prevention for all private, federal, and state payers. Mr. Bittinger has represented physicians across multiple disciplines, home health agencies, nursing facilities, medical groups, medical facilities, medical consultants, in Medicare appeals, Medicaid appeals, RAC audits, ZPIC audits, federal regulatory termination and exclusions proceedings, False Claims Act defense and prosecution, and healthcare litigation. He has assisted numerous physician groups, medical corporations, and medical product manufacturers with strategic growth plans, successions, and transactions by assessing the reimbursement health of medical entities. His healthcare team has developed unique strategies for responding to defense of RAC, ZPIC, and major payer audits and appeals that have led to, to collaborative work with government regulators, healthcare associates, and healthcare law firms across the country. He has also served as reimbursement counsel for healthcare transactions to determine risks associated with the potential recoupment of post-payment claims. Hey, go ahead, Stephen. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, well, that was quite a mouthful, uh, but I'll boil it all down for, for everybody to this. Um, I'm a reimbursement legal geek, um, so, <laughs> so we, we are a unique team um, that, that uh, focuses on the healthcare reimbursement process and all the different legal and regulatory entanglements uh, that ensue from it. And so I, I'm really grateful uh, to Dr. Brooks for the opportunity to speak again today. Um, this is an area that I am I fell in love with a number of years ago and have become quite passionate about. Uh, and I've got the privilege to represent payers all over the country. Um, I just picked up my farthest client. Uh, I have a client in Alaska now. Um, I'm still betting on the client in Hawaii. So I, I haven't gotten one in Hawaii, but I'm working on it. Um, but the bottom line is that the uh, the arena of reimbursement is extremely high risk. Um, besides perhaps securities law, uh, healthcare reimbursement is one of the highest scrutinized and complex areas uh, of regulation in our country. And so uh, I really like to do everything I can to help providers who begin in a very difficult position um, and they often have to rely on many people uh, and not their own knowledge, and, and so I, I enjoy the opportunity to help educate. So today we're really going to focus on an evolution that's taken place over the past uh, about 18 months. Um, the, over, the retention of overpayments and the start of the Reverse False Claims Act era, and we'll get into some of those details um, we will spend the majority of our time focusing on overpayment retention and self-disclosures. Um, I'm going to give you a quick update on UPICs um, at the end and a status on some revision to the CMS appeals process also because I think those are very timely for where we're at. And so um, I'm going to begin with kind of a highlight uh, for this is our, our agenda. So. For reverse false claims, uh, overpayment retention, and self-disclosures, we're about a, a little over a year out from the new final rule on uh, the 60-day overpayment disclosure rule. And when it was broadened significantly, and so we're going to look at you know, how has uh, the penalty aspect of improper retention of overpayments been implemented. Um, what are some of the predictions that we have on enforcement thus far? 
And then we're going to go into some of the nuts and bolts, the, the timing of overpayment investigation, how we identify overpayments, and what are the disclosure processes. And then absolutely pivotal is the difference between a MAC or administrative disclosure for an aired payment and uh, self-disclosure protocol, the SDP process with the OIG. And, and many, many state AGs have a similar SDP process. Uh, towards the end, we we're going to do a quick update on UPICS, the Unified Program Integrity Contractors, which uh, are going to be rolling out in 2018. And it is going to be a completely different world for federal and Medicaid-based integrity reviews. And then the, uh, the, the ever-belabored <laughs> CMS appeals process, um, we're going to look at uh, some of the changes that went out in March of 17 and see whether they are taking effect and helping uh, our, pro our difficulties in the enormous backlog of appeals. All right, so one year. We're a little over a year out, and I... Uh, we, we look at year one, all right? Do we know how this works and will be enforced yet? That was the biggest question. Um, when the new 60-day rule came out in March of last year, um, we, we, we had to wrestle with, and there was 12 months worth of federal registry comments and debate on a lot of different topics and nuances regarding applying uh, both civil and potential criminal liability to the retention of overpayments and we have now shaken through a couple rounds of legal proceedings involving this specific issue and uh, I, I've been involved in a number of those and and so it's an evol it's a it's a changing area uh, with a lot of dynamics to it but the bottom line is that the original 60-day rule came out in 2010, and it was the requirements to report and return overpayments. Uh, they made it an affirmative duty of the provider um, or entity who received notice of it, and they had a duty to report. We didn't put teeth on the, that duty um, and reply uh, False Claims Act liability until March of last year. So here's some of the same. Here's some comparisons, just generally. Uh, the the rule is the same in that overpayments must be reported and returned by the later of 60 days after the date of the overpayment was quote identified. And there's been a lot of debate over identification, or the date any cost report was due. If so, if you are a large facility and have a cost report associated, um, that is your timetable. What's new is that a person who did not make a timely refund of any overpayment is now subject to civil and criminal penalties under the False Claims Act. And it has uh, taken on the name of reverse false claims. And I apologize, there are a couple typos I've noticed in my presentation. But um, we're going to talk about reverse false claims and well that means uh, I'm not going to go into a great detail on what the potential penalties are for under the False Claims Act uh, but I can give you a general guidance in that um, potential penalties can range up to eleven thousand dollars per improper claim presented to the government and so in reverse false claims that's per improper claim held and they can also, you can also have treble damages for the total amount. Um, but we're not going to sink our teeth into false claims itself, um, just its connection with overpayment retention. All right, identified. This, this is the primary issue uh, with reverse false claims. So how do you identify an overpayment? And this is the definition that came up. When the person has or should have through the exercise of reasonable diligence, determined that the person has received an overpayment, quote, and quantified the amount of the overpayment. Uh, the second leg on that definition is the burdensome one. And so we're going to talk about how you quantify, what it means to quantify, and then we're, we're going to stick with the general parameters for federal and, and state payers and then I'll, I'll lead over into some of the nuances on privates. Keynote, 
Um, under 42 CFR 401-305-A2, we need to clarify that the overpayment has not been identified until the amount of the overpayment has been quantified. And why do I cite uh, a very nuanced regulation? Because it's in black and white, and quantification is the hardest thing to do. So we find an error, and then we have to determine if it is a regular error, if it is a, uh, a systematic or a periodic error, and then we have to determine how do we get our arms around a method to quantify it, and, and, and then come up with an actual figure. Should have known is also tricky. So when should a provider have known? So if the person fails to, quote, exercise reasonable diligence, and the person, in fact, received an overpayment, this is new. Um, this is a part of the threshold for intentional misconduct um, or reckless misconduct. So underneath the False Claims Act, you can either intentionally present false claims or you can recklessly prevent false claims. So most people think you have to come up with a fraud scheme to be liable for false claims, and actually that's not the truth. Uh, the law holds that you can recklessly, which means you just ignore all the rules. And we've applied the same standard here uh, for reverse false claims. All right. So as we uh, get into some of the, the layers underneath the big requirements, uh, we're going to talk about step-by-step -step processes. And so... Uh, the re reasonable diligence standard is within uh, your investigation. This is your time period. We're trying to figure out, hey, we found this error. All right, this error occurred. Um, a lot of times, you know, someone dealing with reimbursement, a billing manager, a coder, a CFO gets this information. All right, this doesn't look right. Now we have to start investigation. So you have a reasonably diligent standard, which means that you, you must demonstrate through timely, good faith investigation of credible information. All right, we, we won't get into what is credible and what is not, but normally I can tell you that if something looks afoul from the people that normally do it, all right, people that are a part of the process uh, all the time and they're educated and, and their, their daily routine is involving um, payments from the uh, from medical services and they think something's wrong, that's probably going to be judged to be credible. All right. So keynote, um, False Claims Act courts have determined that identification is equivalent to notice. And notice is very key within the legal world. That means like someone sent you a letter saying this is wrong. <laughs> All right. So identification is for purposes of investigating an overpayment is the same as we received credible evidence. So you're on notice that you need to start this process. And they've determined that the 60-day rule begins when the healthcare provider had notice of a possible claim. Not, not you know, we definitely owe this much money. It's, you know, hey, you know, Friday services look like they're a problem. All right. I don't understand why we're having all this reimbursement coming in for dates of service on Friday when Dr. John is not here. Um, we need to investigate something. All right, that's when your clock starts. So the question is, um, how long does that clock run? All right, so how long is timely? So that brings us to uh, a, a, a significantly debated and unfortunately unclear result for a lot of people uh, as, as we've gone through this 18 months worth of evaluation of reverse false claims. And, and I'm going to place some blame on CMS for not building it into the rule revision um, because the time frame actually came out in the commentary, in the registry commentary. And so if you don't uh, if you aren't a super nerd like me that reads Federal Registry commentary, um, then, then you would have missed it. And, and unfortunately, even a lot of legal advisors in this arena 
um, didn't have a clear standard because it was obscure in, in, in the time parameters. So what we do know is that CMS com comments have established uh, a definite six-month outside limit on reasonable diligence. All right, the quote is six months from receipt of credible information except in extraordinary circumstances. All right, CMS concluded that providers must prioritize the investigations despite devotion of time and resources because, quote, a total of eight months, six months for timely investigation and two months for reporting and returning is a reasonable amount of time absent extraordinary circumstances. So law school questions 101 for bar prep, what are extraordinary circumstances? And I got to tell you, this isn't, you know, extraordinary circumstances is not the business is closing down or, or you know, Dr. Smith, Smith left the practice. Extraordinary circumstances are generally defined in the law as acts of God. All right, they are things beyond our control, like Hurricane Irma, you know, wiping out all the records. That is an extraordinary circumstance. Um, one of the key issues for people to understand is that even if a provider has left or even if ownership has changed, the duties still exist for identifying an overpayment. And then I'm going to pause here real quick for a current case that I'm working with where a new provider bought a medical facility, discovered that there was approximately $400,000 worth of improper overpayments being held and the prior owners refused to repay the money. Well, the, 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 the purchaser bought a mess. But what did he have to do? He bought the entity whole with all its duties, with all its contracts. So it, it's now his obligation. So he had to pay back $400,000 and then he had to clean it up. And, and so that's a poor uh, business decision because he didn't do enough due diligence in the investigation, um, could have been fraud in the transaction. But the bottom line is that is not extraordinary circumstances. The law won't care that he got a bad deal. The law just wants to make sure that the payers get their money back. So um, it, it's harsh, but unfortunately, <laughs> Anybody who deals with CMS or Medicaid or the payers understands that this is a harsh arena. All right, so now we're talking about timing of overpayment investigation, identification, and disclosure. And we're going to break down into some of the specific details. So um, the new guidance all right, that we've received from the new final rule all right, makes it clear that providers have only six months for investigation and that overpayments must be returned within the following two months or else uh, continued retention of the overpayment can subject the provider to reverse false claims liability. And I'm going to pause real quick. Um, for anybody who's never spent a lot of time on false claims liability, there's actually three levels of liability. Um, there is, and we'll start with the highest, ugliest level, that's criminal false claims, uh, that somebody's going to go to jail, and they're also um, liable not only for the crimes, but they're also responsible for restitution, uh, which is much broader than even the reimbursement liability, and then they have, then the second level is civil liability, so the government can go after uh, improper retention of overpayments on a civil basis, meaning we think this was reckless. Um, we certainly want all this money back. And then there's private civil liability, which is if you have a whistleblower um, and the whistleblower has counsel that is willing to pursue the case privately, um, that whistleblower can get private liability on behalf of the government as they're subrogated into the citizen's rights of a relator. So there's three different levels to that. So we're going to break down into what is part of a reasonable investigation. So we can have come away with some good nuts and bolts. You, uh, you, you discover that there's an issue, you think it's credible, and then we need to put together a plan. So here are uh, investigated elements. And these are some of the primary components. This is not an exhaustive list, 
Um, this list will vary significantly depend on the type of medical practice that is involved um, or you know rural public publicly owned hospitals this is a very different process than it is for a small pain management practice um, but these are some primary elements that are fairly universal across all of the different situations so first, you need to assign a responsible individual with a timeline to ensure completion within six months. And a responsible individual can vary between the type of entity, but a responsible, a responsible individual is somebody that you know is definitely going to follow through and get the job done. Uh, you're going to document how the error was discovered. And most people are terrified of this. Most people think, I don't want to tell anybody. I don't even want to put it in email. Um, they, they run down the hall and say, Here, here's, here's this evidence, um, you know, lawyer or owning doctor. Um, I don't want to tell anybody about it. And unfortunately, uh, in larger practices and entities, a lot of times your decision makers make the wrong decision. All right, so I, I have had plenty of cases where large, you know, l large entities have had a compliance officer or vice president or CEO, you know, receive information and not appropriately document the process of origination of the error. In other words, who told me about it, on what date, what evidence did they base the error upon? And, and have that well documented so that they could begin their process. So origination of the error is key. A lot of times people miss this. And, and, and I gotta tell you that number one, origination of the error is your absolute most valuable information for false claims defense. So in our false claims defense work, the intent of the party is absolutely essential. So if, if you only have what we did for six months afterwards to fix the money and not how did we discover it and, you know, was, was this new information was, you know, and, and you don't document where the origination came from, it's very hard to put the story together 10 months later, 12 months later. All right, so you want to outline proposed steps to investigation and the dates they get completed. So I, I use this much similar to uh, you know the living CMS compliance plan that all practices now should have. Um, but you put together your plan, and then it's a checklist. It's a working document. You know these people put in their names, completed this step on this date. Put in the date, sign it. All right. So we have a clear record of when things got done, who did them, and when they were completed. All right. Documents information gathered and this is all information too many times and, and see I, I I'm, a, I'm a trial lawyer at heart um, so I got to tell you you know I a number of years ago I, I tried small cases funny cases uh, you know one case was literally like whose cow broke the fence um, or, or you know small business disputes understanding all the sources of information from a trial perspective is essential in this. So it's not just this is the EOBs, this is the billing record, you know, these are the medical records. That's a very limited scope of information. You need to include all the people involved in the process, providers, billers, medical assistants, scribes, what are their names, what are their contact information, when did they learn about this information, and you need to conduct an interview process of all of them so that you gather the full picture. And like I always tell, I try to tell people is that, you know, think end game in mind. If, if this went south and someone, you know, wanted to be a whistleblower on this issue, what is the movie you're going to play in, to a jury at the final trial of this potential issue? It is these are all my witnesses, they tell their stories, this is the information they have to say, and we have this documentation. So 
So make sure to include the full scope of evidence that you have available when documenting this. So identify people involved, including NPIs. Um, you know, and, and, and a lot of people miss this, but not just uh, NPIs, but licensures, licensures by, by state. Uh, lots of providers have multiple state licensures. Um, what's their scope of practice? Any additional credentialing or certifications uh, for specialty practices? Make sure that's all in there. You want to determine how the error occurred and root causes that contributed to the error. So not only this is our error, but you're going to backtrack in time and you're going to figure out, okay, well, we had this supervision problem and, and we realized that the policy that we had internally was unclear and that we didn't, ha we didn't have uh, a payer matrix that included all of the nuances of supervision requirements for this service um, with the compliance officer and, or that, that payer matrix hadn't been updated for three years and there had been policy changes on the different payers and you're going to work backwards until you figure out how it happened and then you're going to work forwards with a corrective action plan. Your corrective action plan uh, is should be thorough, should be detailed, should be person-centric, meaning that these people are doing these jobs and it should be the actual people that are conducting them, not Manila, like medical director or compliance officer. Um, it, it should be, you know, Jane, who, who is our medical director, and it should be, you know, Bill, who's our compliance officer, will be doing these jobs. And this is how we're correcting it. And this is the standard protocol we're going to set up moving forward so that we make sure we prevent repetition of the problem. Then here's the tricky part. All right. So uh, as I like to say, I'm, I'm a lawyer. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm really a data geek. Uh, I, I know the law but I, I live in a world of numbers and codes and, and policies um, and, and my primary opponents most of the time are the data miners inside the payers. You know, the, the ones who are part of the SIU team who follow trends and, and send off alerts on service issues. So when we get into the look back period, uh, major change from C, for CMS from March of last year is that they extended the look back period from four to six years. So we have a six year look back period on Medicare, Medicaid, your military plans like TRICARE, um, Advantage plans, so uh, federal employee plans, even though they're administered by a private payer or, or another TPA, um, you, that's still federal funds. And so we have a six-year universal look-back period on federally-based funds. So make sure you understand that. Now for privates, um, and this will, and the reason we're not going to spend a great deal of time is because we will fall into what I would like to say is Alice in Wonderland's rabbit hole of, of conflicts between jurisdictions if we look at look-back periods for application of reverse false claims on private payers. Most private payers have a look back period between 18 months and, and 36 months, and that's contractual. But the problem is, is that, that those are the universal participating provider agreement terms that are circulated to all providers, but then each state has separate statutory law that may cut that off earlier. All right, and so you have to look at the combination of contractual law between the practice and the payer and the statutory law of the state because in a battle of, of which law trumps between contract and statutory law, statutory law can trump. All right? However, if we are looking at federal law versus statutory law and contract law, federal law trumps them all. All right, so that's one of those lawyer nuances that you've got to be careful of. All right, 
Uh, timing of overpayment investigation, um, we got to figure out the quantification, all right? And so this is, this is our math element. So quantifying the overpayment. It is important to understand that an overpayment is not necessarily the entire amount received in error. Despite what all my opponents out there, all of these Z-picks and, and rack auditors and the U-picks coming, uh, just because an error was made doesn't mean that the entire amount of reimbursement was wrong and needs to be paid back. We have had wars over the 15% margin on Incident 2 when all it's owed is 15% on Incident 2. So you've got to be able to quantify it and justify it. And you can save yourself an enormous amount of money if you are willing to do this correctly. The overpayment may, in fact, be only the difference between the amount received and the amount that should have been received had the error not occurred. And sometimes that is minuscule. All right. I mean, I, I have I have improper codes that you know on small services that have caused a two three dollar error. However, based on the volume, that's three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars. But you you need to have a well documented, statistically accurate analysis to be able to prove that. Keynote, overpayments under this rule cannot be offset with contemporaneously discovered underpayments. So if you're combing through claims and you say, oh, we forgot to bill these services, uh, you're not allowed to offset the amount owed by the amount discovered. All right. For underpayments, all right, you can only ask that they be reopened, all right, and there's a specific regulatory process for reopening of claims. All right, um, here's kind of some final notes before we shift to a few other segments and, and open up for questions towards the end. Um, 60 day rule applies to parts A and B payments for Medicare, Medicaid, and all other federally funded programs, uh, TRICARE, et cetera. Medicare parts C and D all right, have separate rules for reporting and returning overpayments. Um, that is a small uh, thesis in itself on, on parts C and particularly part D. So if, if anybody has questions on that, we can. I'm glad to help out separately on that one. Also very important, self-referrals. All right. So while the, the procedures and timing is similar to the investigation and reporting violations of the ACA for self-referrals, right, the method of disclosure and determination of amount to be repaid is very different for self-referrals. And so self-referrals are, you know, improper arrangements, all right, um, improper kickbacks, those type of things. And if, if you have that type of mess that you think you've discovered, it's not an overpayment. So I'll try to slow down real quick and just repeat that because it's extremely important. If you have a suspected kickback, or a suspected improper arrangement of how a provider or a practice is being paid, and it's not an aired reimbursement, that is not a part of what we're talking about today. That's not under the overpayment analysis. That is under self-referrals or kickback statutes, and that is over on the OIG or the Attorney General at the state side. So for private payers, um, we don't have time to go into all the conflicting nuances with private payers, but I want to make one thing very clear is that the 60-day rule procedures and policies are not the same for private payers and patients. Patients too. People forget that cash patients have got the same rights when it comes to an overpayment. All right, and how they must be investigated or determined separately. On the flip side of that, and I didn't put it in writing here because it's not universal, um, the 60-day rule may apply for many private payers who have a bucket clause that said if they don't specifically state, you know, if a provider finds an overpayment, 
they must return it in X amount of days. Every single other participating provider agreement has a bucket clause. So if it's not spelled out in the contract or in a policy manual, their bucket clause says, if we have not expressly stated a rule here, we default to CMS standards. So if there's a bucket clause of something not expressly stated in the contract, then you're going to fall back to the 60-day rule. So you may be under the same standard. You've got to read the contract. And the one thing I'll tell you is that there's a lot of practices out there that signed an original contract 15, 20 years ago, and they have done auto-electronic um, re recredentialing every year, and they have not even looked at a contract in 15 years, so they don't know whether they are current or not or what their contract says. So side note, very important, make sure you have a copy of your current contracts. So if you're an office manager or compliance officer and you don't have a 2016, 2017 copy of the contract for every one of your payers, you need to put that on the list and go get them. All right. We are over to the difference between the OIG self-disclosure protocol and MAC self-disclosure. So what are they? Um, OIG SDP are matters that potentially violate federal criminal, civil, or administrative laws for which civil monetary penalties are authorized. Um, civil monetary penalties is just a big hammer all right, that CMS uses uh, or the federal government uses to um, try to control improper behaviors. All right, what is a max self-disclosure? That is overpayments or billing and coding errors. So I got to tell you that, um, you know, I represent practices all over the country, and 95 probably percent of the time, when even large dollar value errors that come to me are error-based. They're on the right side. They're a max self-disclosure. They're not OIG self-disclosure protocols because it's not a kickback, it's not an improper structure, um, it's somebody made a billing mistake, even if it's a very expensive billing mistake. So let's talk about when, all right? When is very different uh, for these two processes. So for uh, SDP, uh, within 60 days of confirming and quantifying the total, and we can get into the nuances of that it's the same. <coughs> it's the same for billing and coding, as far as the language requirements. But the quantification element is materially very significant and different. So let me talk about how, what I mean. So if we have a kickback, in other words, you know, hey, I've got this lab arrangement. And I really wasn't doing anything, but every time I referred these labs out to this company in Texas, you know, they sent me $200 back. And I know that, you know, Lab ABC out of Texas paid me $200 for every one of these labs, and my bookkeeper put it all in, in my accounting software. And then I discover, or I, I should have known to start with, we'll start there, should have known that that was an illegal kickback. Quantification is very easy. I can go to my QuickBooks and I can pull up what's the total amount received from Lab ABC in Texas. Bam, your 60 days started. It's not difficult. Your reasonable diligence standard is extremely short. Let's flip that over to a max self disclosure. If you have an overpayment issue, all right, and, and it could be five, six, ten million dollars, all right, involved in this but it's a nuanced difference between conflicting policies or policy effectiveness changes, um, lots of different variances in there. You know, a $10 million overpayment could take every, all hands on deck every day for six months to get your arms around exactly what the real figure is. So the, the rule says the same, but factually they're very different. All right, how? How are these, these processes different? Um, they are starkly different in process, 
and 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 level of risk and expense too. So the large expense in quantification is with self-disclosure protocol for the MAC. How though under the SDP is the process by which you disclose the amount. Uh, you must specifically identify the statutes and all of the potential violations. A self-disclosure protocol is something that a lawyer must help you with because it is extremely complex and you are going before the Office of Inspector General, which is the Department of Justice and federal prosecutors and saying, I'm asking for mercy and here's all the laws and all the figures of, of how I violated the law, give me mercy. All right. Versus max self-disclosure, if you have quantified everything within your diligence standard of six months, then you have 60 days and disclosure to a MAC of an overpayment most of the time is a one to two page form where you attach a spreadsheet of the claim numbers so that they can adjust the claims or you, you include it in, in the breakdown. And, and we help with max self-disclosures all the time that are a lot of work to get a final figure and it takes five minutes to fill out the form and send in a check. So, so how you get it done is very different. All right. All right. So we're going to slide over here with about 17 minutes left into a couple other very hot topics right now. All right. The you pick. Um, Hopefully, if you are a compliance officer on this line or the, uh, the, the owning provider of a smaller practice and you have not um, informed yourself of what the UPIC is, please pay close attention to this section. All right. Now, the UPIC is the Unified Program Integrity Contractor. All right. As I like to say, this is... Uh, this is Terminator 2.0, all right? This is the, the new revised integrity auditor for CMS. So we're going to go over um, rather quickly an overview implementation, how and why is a UPIC different from a RAC or a ZPIC, uh, and the countdown to when they're going to be here, all right? The UPIC is the Fraud, Waste, and Abuse Auditor. It was formed as part of the Comprehensive Medicaid Integrity Plan, CMIP, uh, to wrap all federally funded integrity reviews into a single audit. Let's talk practical real quick. For any provider groups that are predominantly in a low income retirement area, we are now talking about an auditor that has scope of review over the vast majority of your patient population. Medicaid, Medicare, if you're on a military basis. So this is why it's so important is because they can put all of those lines of revenue at risk at the same time. So the UPIC is supposed to improve Medicaid data and expand the use of this information for integrity work. It's supposed to improve the state management capacity to protect Medicaid integrity. And it's supposed to improve federal management of Medicaid integrity. All right, uh, here we go with my, uh, I might get a jab or two in there, but I'll be nice. Um, the, the government spending. So CMS has awarded multiple 10 year, 2.5 billion, that's right, billion IDIQs. First time I heard, first time I heard about an IDIQ contract, I, I was completely shocked, but yes, these are 2.5, 10-year, billion-dollar contracts that have an indefinite delivery and an indefinite quantity. Yep, that's a government blank check, all right, <laughs> for a lot of money. All right, and uh, you pick contracts in support of CMS audit, oversight, anti-fraud, waste and abuse, and general budget. So there's five zones for the you picks. Uh, used to be seven for the Z picks, but we're down to five. All right, there's the Western, Midwestern, Southwestern, Northeastern, and Southeastern. All right, we have uh, three known awards. Um, there have been some conflicting issues, and I think we may have a, uh, a government contract dispute process going on in the background that is not public record. Uh, but we have three confirmed awards. For the Western District, it's Health Integrity. 
For the Northeast, it's Safeguard Services. And for Midwestern, it's Advanced Med. All right, UPIC. Uh, the work completed by the ZPICs and the PSCs will be phased out, and the UPICs will transition into the primary audit investigation body over the next two to three years. Um, and it says it's, and I say two to three years because some of the PSC contracts and ZPIC contracts have different lapse points because of when they started. To date, neither CMS nor UPICs have released specific time frames uh, beyond the original statement of work, which says that there has to be implementation for 2018. I can tell you that um, Advanced Med is leading the way, and, and Advanced Med believes that they are going to start UPIC activity um, before 2018 in the fourth quarter of this year. So right here in my beloved Midwest, I think we're going to get our first taste of a UPIC. From current experience with ZPIC investigations, the volume of new investigations appears to have dwindled with only extreme outliers currently receiving new notices while these contracts are preparing for the UPIC integration and rollout. So what I got to tell you is that in my work with Audit Defense, we had a really high run with ZPICs over the last several years, and then the UPIC bidding contractors decreased in volume over the last six to eight months. And so, in my mind, they're all still working, getting paid for something, so they're getting ready for the UPIC. I certainly could be wrong. All right, so a quick update on uh, Medicare appeals. We had a new final rule in March of this year. All right, uh, it made some changes and new processes, and the big question, did it solve the ALJ backlog, <laughs> which is, which I, I'm, I'm quickly getting old waiting on appeals here. All right, so the final rule of March of this year um, made some really, in, in my mind as, a, as an attorney, some very important um, amendments to the process. So uh, it permits the use of Medicare Appeals Council decisions as precedental to provide more consistency in the ALJ decisions. This is enormous. So what this means is that the, the board can select decisions and say, this is our binding authority on this issue. So if we have a similar service that has already been decided by the appeals board, and I'm trying to advise a client, is it worth spending a mountain of money and waiting three years to appeal these services. I now have a binding opinion. If it's the same identical issue, I can say, no, it's not. I used to have to say, I don't know. We have to figure out which ALJ we get because we didn't have a binding precedent. And so this makes the whole process uh, more predictable, which is good. Even if it's not you know, ultimately perfect for providers, and the decisions aren't the best, predictability can prevent a significant amount of waste. And, and so that, that is very useful. Uh, most importantly, the, uh, the appeals boards can also be binding upon CMS, HHS adjudicators, including MACs and QUICs. So uh, a board decision can be enforced all the way down the line. All right, and, and the positive side to that is that I can take a board decision now and I can use that to prove all right, that a max decision was wrong when I appeal to the quick. And then the quick has to follow the board's ruling. So I can overturn appeals faster. This allows uh, attorney adjudicators to decide certain types of appeals. Cases that do not require hearing, all right, fully favorable, um, I don't have to spend the time or money if I know I'm going to win on black and white written rule or if the appellant waives the right to a hearing. A request for review of a dismissal made by a MAC or a QUIC, um, I will quickly be able to determine if you know, this, this jurisdiction's MAC is making an improper decision on this service because the QUIC is constantly overturning them. And I can, I can, if I finally get an appeals board decision on that, 
I can get the Mac to stop making that bad decision. And then we have good cause determinations on submission of new evidence. Believe it or not, as long and painful as this process is, new evidence does come up. So we have limits. Um, it also limits the number of CMS contractor entities that can participate in a hearing. Um, we, we used to have unlimited participation, which meant that you know we could be in a hearing that had seven different parties because the service was an issue across many jurisdictions. That's a nightmare, especially for a telephone hearing. So thankfully that's changed. Process efficiencies. Expanding communication between appellants and ALJs and the information that Omaha requires with the appeal request. ALJs may vacate their own dismissals rather than the appellant appealing to the MAC. Uh, we have increased use of telephone hearings, which is wonderful for me because I have clients all over the country because uh, it's a federally administrative process. I don't have to be licensed anywhere else in the country to do this, and that way my clients don't have to pay for me to travel everywhere. Quality control of the MAC uh, remand process. We have adjudication time frame for remands, which is really important, and it happens more than people realize. We have a simplified escalation process, uh, providing more information regarding what constitutes good cause for submitting new information. And I got to tell you the number of times that I have taken over appeals by other attorneys or practices that have tried to appeal themselves, I almost inevitably find good cause for submitting additional evidence. All right, so is the final rule helping? I got to tell you, it's too soon to tell. <laughs> the, the, the loggerhead is too big to determine how much it's going to help right now. Um, the average processing time for an appeal uh, to the ALJ level is still over a thousand days. Now there are a couple small programs for, um, uh, bas basically it's like a mediation process. If it's under $150,000 on certain type of services, uh, you can go through a mediation process that happens a lot faster, um, but if you have a substantial appeal, it's still a long line. So if you file appeal today, you likely won't have a decision until 2020. Yes, it's painful. But i got to tell you that sometimes it's worth it. If you have a substantial amount of funds and you have a good solid basis that you know you can overturn it, Despite that there's statutory 9.5% interest on that enormous debt, if you know you can overturn it, the government has to pay you back the money plus interest. So it can be successful. You just got to be very sure of what you're doing. So is it worth the wait? Um, ALJ decisions are generally the most favorable of all level of Medicare appeals processes in 2012. Um, HHS found that 55% of ALJ decisions were fully favorable and 6% were partially favorable. So over 50% of the time, you could overturn the quick and the MAC. Today it's less than that. Today it's only about 28% um, and 1.7 for partially favorable. That's still almost a third of the time. I don't think the ALJ's rulings are different. What's actually happening is we're getting much more favorable rulings at the lower levels. Um, I have to tell you that the C2C is doing an incredible job at the quick, and they have really put together some streamlined processes and in, hired some very qualified people, and we are overturning far more appeals at uh, the second level. And so that is probably the primary component for the statistical change at the ALJ level. So, with my rattling coming to a, a conclusion with nearly five minutes to go, there's my contact information, and I, I greatly appreciated the opportunity to present. And uh, Dr. Brooks, I, I will reach out to you and turn it over to see if we have any questions coming in. Stephen, thank you so much. Uh, we do have a few questions. Um, why haven't we seen False Claims Act court cases based on reverse false claims yet? 
Uh, well, the, the, the simple answer to that is we have not seen a lot of publicly disclosed opinions because False Claims Act proceedings are sealed, which means they're confidential uh, normally for the first 12 to 24 months uh, while they're being investigating. Well, while they're being investigated. So when this rule became effective in March of 16, we, and if someone discovered uh, an overpayment retention in April of 16, we could have a case filed in April or May of 16, but it most likely is still under seal. Okay. Um, can you give some examples of when a provider should have known an overpayment was received? Yeah, I'll give you some uh, <laughs> some 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 comical ones. Um, you know, I have a provider who um, comically all of a sudden got paid six times as much for the same service when they changed the CPT code and didn't change anything. I got to tell you, that's an alarm. All right, <laughs> something's different because insurance companies don't just randomly want to pay you six times as much for the same service. So um, I've had them all over the place, um, but if all of a sudden you are getting paid phenomenally well for something that your, your counterparts are not, you need to investigate. Who qualifies as the responsible individual for uh, the purposes of conducting the overpayment investigation? Well, there isn't a set definition. Uh, it's important to understand that it has to be someone with adequate understanding, education, and, and authority to be able to complete the investigation. So I've got to tell you that, you know, if you're a uh, four-provider dental practice um, and, and Jerry is your new office manager, Jerry could be a great guy. But if Jerry has only been there four months and all he's really doing is, is you know, patient flow in QuickBooks, he isn't going to be qualified. You're probably going to end up being, you know, having to have the owning provider or even a third party. Sometimes if you don't have that person internally, um, you, you hire the appropriate person to do it as a third party. Okay, and last question. How do you know whether a violation of administrative laws, uh, which include CMS guidelines, goes to the OIG or the MAC? All right, well, the, the ultimate question to that is the intent of the party. So um, I'll give you a real concrete definition. You know, incident two has been going on forever. Um, if you discover a letter or an email from a doctor that says, it doesn't matter that I'm not in the office um, or I'm not, I don't have remote access, just bill everything underneath my NPI anyway, even though that is a regulatory violation for incident two, it's intentionally wrong because of the plan. Now, if you have a doctor who says, I don't understand the supervision, and I think we can still bill it under my NPI, even though it's being provided by a mid-level. That is not intentional. That's a, a billing error, and that goes to the MAC. All right. Well, thank you again, Stephen. It was an excellent presentation. Um, please use his contact information on the screen for any more questions. Uh, if you send us questions, I will forward them on to him. You can register for our future webinars or request a demo of our compliance solution on our website at 1sthcc.com or give us a call at 888-543-4778. Thank you again and have a wonderful day.